Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this Tech Strong Learning Experience brought to you by Incredibuild. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of Tech Strong Learning, and we do have an exciting panel ahead. First, before I turn it over, we do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, maybe you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions, we want you to direct those to the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of the screen. Right next to that Q&A tab, you'll also see the chat tab, and that's where we'd like you to uh, send in your more general comments or um, go ahead and get it warmed up by letting us know from where you are joining us right now. Click the handouts tab. You will see there are a couple of resources that are available for you, so feel free to grab those. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So the topic of our discussion today is how DevOps drives software-defined vehicles. And I'm joined by Yohai West, Director of Product Marketing at Incredibuild, Michael Plague, VP of Ecosystem Development at Eclipse Foundation, and Ilya Dubovsky, Founder at BeamReach Cloud. Today, leading our conversation, we'd have our very own Mike Vizard, who is the Chief Content Officer here at TechStrong Group. Mike, thank you for joining us. Ilya, Michael, and Yohai, thank you for being here as well. Let's go ahead and get this conversation kicked off. Mike. Thanks, Cody, and thanks everybody for watching. We're gonna start this off with three short little presentations talking about the state of the world, and then we're gonna jump into conversations and Q&A we encourage you guys to put the chat or the Q&A, whichever one you want. in during the presentations, we'll be addressing those questions as we go along rather than waiting to the end because we want this whole conversation to be interactive. Ilya is going to start out with a description of where we are and then what makes DevOps different when it comes to software-defined vehicles and what are some of the challenges and the nuances that go into that whole process. Yohai is going to share some of his uh, experiences talking with customers in this space and what he's hearing from them. And then Michael is going to explain a little bit about how more folks are collaborating around some of these projects that the Eclipse Foundation is leading to create a more common platform for creating software-defined vehicles. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ilya, who's going to start us off. And once again, he has a couple of slides there in the handout section if you want to find them. Ilya, take it away. Thank you, Mike. I'm so happy to be here. Um, just really quickly going to go through a list of what I believe are uh, main features of DevOps in automotive sector or DevOps in software defined vehicles. And I'm going to just start off with an obvious requirement for all the modern vehicles that are being developed is over the year updates or over the year deployments. And even though a lot of companies, a lot of modern companies are de de um, developing their own OTA systems, DevOps can definitely make a great impact in bootstrapping this from day zero and making over the year updates available as soon as the first release of firmware. So that is a very exciting um, opportunity for all the DevOps engineers out there in the space. And I encourage everyone to look closely at that, look closely at all the other, all the new um, systems available that can help you get this on day zero. All right, next point that I wanted to talk about is integrations with connected devices. Pretty much every, uh, every software on wheels or every software defined vehicle is now a set of connected devices that are connected to the digital ecosystem that are connected to other cars that are connected within a car. And that's, that's an exciting feature of the modern uh, sector. And that's definitely something every DevOps in automotive has, has to take into account. With this high amount of integrations, with the high amount of upstream downstream systems, upstream downstream dependencies come great opportunities and also very difficult uh, technical challenges that you have to overcome. Uh, and th this brings me straight to the next point, microservice dependencies. That's exactly what I just um, 
pretty much almost exactly what I just talked about. Uh, you have to make sure that all of your microservices understand. It, actually, you need to understand and the team needs to understand that how those microservices depend on each other. You need to be able to resolve circular dependencies. And uh, overall, you need to, to find a very reliable and very functioning, well-functioning dependency management system. And that's 100% that's, uh, on the shoulders of the DevOps team. Next on our list is diversity of platforms and teams. This is quite straightforward. Um, every vehicle basically has their own OS. You, you have probably heard about uh, the new OS for Mercedes and then other um, cars or other models have different OS and then there are uh, there are cloud uh, services that are, you know, packaged into a Docker and deployed to a cloud. So there is this, uh, 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 there's a large amount of different platforms that are being used in the industry. And as a DevOps, you have to make sure that you are okay with that. And in quite a lot of situations, you have to make sure that your software is packaged in a way that is, uh, platform agnostic. Also, you have different teams developing in different languages and different using different um, architectures, and you have to be able to uh, make sure that these teams can collaborate with each other to make sure that they're not solving the same problem twice. And um, this is a real big challenge in terms of management of your DevOps team as well. Not just the technical, not just from the technical perspective, but from the perspective of the process and uh, the management as well. Well, next one is strict security and quality controls. This is quite obvious. There are a lot of controls, again, from day zero that are being pushed down onto every development team. And as a DevOps, you have to be able to uh, to work with all the security teams, to work with all the QA teams, and be able to provide enough environments for them, and to just basically be um, ready for very strict controls. And you have to be ready to implement those controls into the development processes, into into every team, uh, into every platform that is being de developed in the company. Last two things are extremely interesting. Number one is embedded software. Um, DevOps for embedded software is just basically starting to rise. I have experienced working with a lot of embedded teams that basically do not understand what DevOps is. They rarely have CI CD processes set up, and that's a great opportunity to come in and bring bring that expertise that you have uh, possibly from the from the cloud environment, from the cloud realm, from the software realm into the way that engineering, um, into the way that mechanical engineering and embedded uh, software development works. That's a great opportunity and also the challenge as well. And last but not least is uh, quite often what your doing is very closely related to manufacturing. Even if it's just production of firmware that you need to install on hardware devices, uh, you, ha you already, and this is like the simplest step, you already have to be a part of manufacturing because you have to control what kind of, uh, you know, level zero software you have there that you can work on. That, that you can build the OTA on top of and uh, things like that. Uh, and the other side of this question is uh, robotics. And that's extremely popular now um, and extremely impactful. And, uh, and what I believe is automotive sector is not going too far without robotics. So if you are a DevOps in the automotive sector, then that's a great opportunity for you to work with some robots and uh, you know uh, have a lot of fun solving the problems in robotics and also 
all the other problems that I just listed. That's that's all from my side for now. My, all right. my yeah. Ilya, thanks. That was awesome. Clearly, Yohai, this is not for the faint of heart. And I know you've been talking to some customers about some of the challenges that are out there. And if you don't mind, put some context around those conversations by not everybody here knows exactly what Incredibill does. So putting it all together. Sure. Thank you so much. And uh, great to be here. So I, I think what we, we took away from Ilya is that definitely complexity is ballooning. Uh, the question is, is, is development productivity, uh, is it meeting uh, the right uh, levels, which is uh, required for this amount of complexity? And, you know, looking at customers from uh, many, many domains, it's fascinating to see how the different organizations are dealing with complexity in software development. And as it becomes more and more of a, an issue in automotive, uh, it's amazing to see some of the, uh, the innovations and solutions that are available, one of which is, of course, of, uh, incredible as well. Um, so, you know, a car is pretty much, what, 200 million lines of code? Is that, is that what we're seeing, Mike? I think that was the latest count, uh, which basically means it's a software platform rolling down a hill or, or driving around. Uh, which has with it, of course, um, so much complexity um, in not just one area, right? There's so many parts of that uh, software and OEMs are struggling to almost, you know, connect all those together, sometimes getting different solutions from different areas. Um, and there is there is a call out there to, to create this end-to-end -end automotive software platform, which is a vision that, uh, that uh, definitely will help uh, in, in that, in accelerating uh, the production of vehicles but all in all you know when we speak to our customers some of the largest out there they're all facing the same challenge right there's a high demand um you know even past the, sh the chip shortage past all the other issues around there um it's it's how do you take almost an impossible task of taking what normally would take let's say five years to develop a vehicle and how do you get that down to just two or three uh, and that's a challenge that um, is, you know, across the entire organization, um, but comes very much to the heart of DevOps and DevOps productivity. Uh, and, and everyone is now looking to, you know, from the different departments looking for solutions and how exactly can they do that? Um, just, you know, give you some perspective, you know, the different parts of the, of the software defined vehicle from ADAS uh, to, you know, the infotainment systems out there. An infotainment system alone can take up to, you know, upwards of three or four years to develop um, with hundreds of developers working on countless iterations. And that's just one part of it. Um, the complex complexities that go into um, the autonomous driving and, and simulating um, all those environments um, are, are, are you know, just complex onto their, themselves. And bringing that all together um, creates a, a difficult situation. So, um, you know, what we've seen from, from our customers, the DevOps, they've defined it as like the three Fs, uh, you know, what, what they want. You want faster feedback loops, you want frequent iterations, and far more test coverage. And there's the fourth F, which is the four-letter word, which they yell when someone broke the build, but we'll pass that one off. Um, and for the most part, looking to see how exactly can DevOps organizations take this impossible task uh, of taking what normally takes five years, bringing that down to three years, and how um, our companies are looking to 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 have that done uh, in a short amount of time without heavy lifting. So, you know, in DevOps, there's there's a lot of out there for for um, for different uh, best practices for how to accelerate um, the development. Um, you have automation, you know, the pinnacle of uh, of DevOps. Um, Better collaboration, you know, throughout the different systems is great. Being able to fix vulnerabilities faster or security issues faster. But then there's there's pure unadulterated speed. Uh, and that's what, you know, Incredible offers as a leading dev acceleration platform. Um, and what makes it, you know, unique is that there is, if you look at sort of, you know, the, the entire iteration uh, of, of, of software, especially when you talk about some of the complex systems that are out there today, um, you know, there's a lot of wasted time. There's a lot of time um, compiling all this information, the code, co complex systems out there from, you know, uh, AOSP, um, Yocto, AGL, 
um, AutoSAR, QNX. You know, there's so many things out there now available to this to this uh, community. Um, and um, you know, but those come with those those development times that take a long time, mostly again in C++, which is in itself a very complex language. <laughs> and what we're seeing is that being able to translate or to transfer all that um, compile time or wasted time, true you know speed um, is becoming a, a high priority for many of these organizations. So it, in a nutshell, um, Incredible helps these organizations by uh, cutting down the wait times in these compilations. And the way it does it is we create a network, a grid um, infrastructure that takes every single compute power that you have in your network, both um, on-prem in your facilities or even in the cloud or bursting to the cloud, and allows you to maximize every single core that you have in your organization in order to uh, develop things much faster. And once that we've established that uh, grid network, then we're able to take each development process and break those down into minor mini, mini tasks. And we can farm those out in parallel across your entire network. And whenever there is, let's say, code that has already been built by someone else across the globe, across your organization, then we have a unique build cache that allows you to pretty much just avoid rebuilding things. Altogether, we're helping customers reduce build times um, by astronomical numbers to the point where their goal is a reality. To be able to bring that down from five years to three years is something that teams, especially in the DevOps teams that are looking for productivity um, all through and through are, are enjoying. So that's, um, that's what I'm seeing. Another fascinating point I wanted to bring up is um, we also have a lot of customers in the world of, of gaming and seeing amazingly how the different technologies are now morphing in together. Uh, we have that also, you know, from infotainment systems, looking at, uh, you know, all the applications that are coming from the mobile world, right, mobile uh, solutions. Uh, but particularly in, in, from the gaming perspective, you have a lot of heavy um, uh, systems that are, are used for creating uh, video games. Um, those, uh, you know, uh, Unreal Engine, particularly the one that we've seen a lot of um, being used in multiple facets within the automotive industry. Um, one which is fascinating is if you're looking at autonomous driving today, um, you know, one of the challenges there as well is how do you train the models um, without having to drive, you know, millions of miles uh, and having that uh, brought down into a simulation of sorts that is all created in a, an almost gaming environment um, using Unreal Engine as the, as the tool uh, to be able to create these uh, virtual environments for you to then train these vehicles. And you know, seeing the applications of you know, the gaming world in crunch time and, and the productivity levels that have over the centuries have been uh, developed, um, it's amazing to see how the automotive industry is adopting that. And we have com customers who are using our technology um, as a, a, an advanced gaming uh, studio to be able to reduce the amount of time of rendering and compilations that go into creating these complex machines. So it's fascinating to see that. And I'd be happy to hear um, what you in the audience uh, can uh, you know, share your experiences about um, the, the different technologies you see as well. Um, but for the most part, um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see how we can close that um, complexity gap from, you know, the, the demands of the industry going more and more and more, you know, the sky's the limit and what you can, you know, last time I think I saw an ad for uh, virtual reality within a car. So, right, you're combining the complexities of just software in a vehicle with an entire domain of AR and augmented reality all in a single you know, car, which is fascinating. So um, I'd be happy to hear with you guys if you have any questions about that um, and uh, turn it over to, to you, Mike. Great, hey, thanks for that perspective. Michael, you have a lot of experience in this space in terms of developing software for the automotive industry. What is the current state of the industry from your perspective? What are the challenges? And just in general, what are you hearing? Yeah. So 
like thanks for the introduction yeah so i'm 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 not sure if i would like to say this but the automotive industry is in deep hmm, you can imagine what the next <laughs> word is right so uh, coming from the figures of 200 million lines of code today i have a different figure which is one mil 100 million but i think the absolute number is not the, the problem at all right but the complexity is forecast to increase to 500 million that means a factor of five so um, if you talk about level four level five autonomous driving another six so how to handle that complexity and how to handle that increase right you will not have five times more developers and similar stuff so um there's maybe just a very very small anecdote in germ i'm, I'm naturally as you can maybe see from my language from my, from my speaking i'm not an english native speaker but i'm a german speaker so there is no difference between security and safety. So whenever you talk in German about these things, you need to add some more additional information, right? But on the other side, when it comes to complexity, we have two different words. The one is complexity, that's similar as in, in English, and that describes a system inherent feature. So you cannot get rid of the complexity because you have so many moving parts. And on the other side, in German, we call it kompliziertheit. And this means that something which is artificial which is added on top, but not necessarily needed. It's maybe added by processes, by business interests, and similar things. So what we see in the traditional automotive industry, there's a lot of this German complicier type. Um, I think overly complex development processes, overly complex things, and Ilya mentioned that there's so many different platforms and, and other things. So why that? Is there value in that different platform? There's a Capgemini study stating that there are 60 different middleware platforms in the automotive industry, 60. And not a single end customer will buy a car for a dedicated specific middleware platform. So do I think we can reduce this to five or to one? No, no way. But if we will reduce that complexity to, from 60 to five, that would be a big step forward to reduce this complexity, type, not the complexity. And still there would be a huge amount of work for the rest by the increase of the complexity in the future. So having that said, the Eclipse Foundation is an open source non-profit organization and we started recently or driven by the community, we started a working group called Eclipse Software Defined Vehicle and we have major players from the automotive industry like Carrier, like Mercedes, like Bosch, Conti, ZF. We have Microsoft, we have Red Hat, we have Zoo, the, among a couple of others, so we have about 33 members right now. And um, you already you mentioned stuff like Autosa, Covisa and other things. And the main difference we would like to to achieve is that we start with a code first approach. We don't start with, let's set together, write specifications, do architecture. The first thing we did is we talked to each and every of the members and said, hey, what kind of software do you have in your company which you would be willing to open up? And within less than 12 months, we already onboarded 15 different projects from companies like Microsoft, Carrier, and others, uh, stuff like containerization frameworks, control planes, and other things. And what we see here, there's a willingness to collaborate because this complicated to get rid of this overly complex things. That's what, what, what the industry wants right now. They see that they are in a big disadvantage compared to new market entrants, maybe from China, but maybe from the high tech vector in the US. So they need to get rid of that overly complex development process. Just think about it. Each and every big automotive project, head unit project or similar, as of today, has a unique tool chain. And this unique tool chain needs to be maintained for 15 years. So that's the time the product is in the market, right? So that's just not doable any longer because other companies have a much more efficient software development process. The traditional automotive industry has a strong pain and they need to change it. And this collaboration model in the open as a vendor neutral collaboration, that's what's currently have a lot of momentum here. And coming to DevOps, so we try to target three different areas with the software we would like to add at the software defined vehicle working. That's the software in the car. And we are not here to reinvent the wheel. So Autosa will be a valid thing in the future. AGL will be, Covisa will be, we build around this one and maybe higher layers. The back end to the cloud, I already mentioned that the community is discussing containerized deployment methods. There are a couple of voices saying, yeah, Kubernetes would not work in the automotive industry. I have not an opinion of this because I'm not the technical guy, but it seems that there's something ongoing. Um, we talk about fleet management systems in the cloud, the cloud backend. And I think the third very important part is tooling. As I said, we have way too complex tooling landscape as of today. And this is not about yeah, getting rid of existing tooling. It's think about the increase of complexity, factor five. If you would get a factor of five more tools into the tool chain, that would that that's just not handleable. So 
the idea from a couple of large OEMs and you want to say, let's see what we can do in open source, how we maybe can collaborate to just reduce that kind of complexity. You will still need to build the things. And at the Clips Foundation, we clearly say there needs to be a place for companies to earn money. But we think that the business models will change in the future. There is a place where there's non-differentiating software, middleware, platform software, where companies will more and more collaborate. And there will be above the value line, the area where companies still will build their differentiating features, their IP, they can sell for money. But we see right now a strong, strong push um, and a strong interest in collaborations on the non-differentiating parts of the software stack. All right. We see that in just about every industry these days. So it's just coming across to all the different verticals. Ilya, I want to start with you with a question. And you kind of touched on this, but one of the things that maybe is a dirty secret about DevOps these days is we're really good at the CI part of the equation and not so good at the CD part of this equation. And here we are trying to do CD across n number of vehicle types and each manufacturer has got multiple years of vehicles that they're now trying to support over, over the air over a long period of time. Do we need to get better at continuous delivery to make all this work? And what's, what's your perspective of where we are on that side of the equation? Um, you're absolutely right. We need to improve drastically on the way that we deploy things. I see in a lot of companies <laughs> that the deployment pipelines are very simple. Uh, p uh, companies usually have a static number of environments uh, that they update on a, some preliminary um, rules that they you know, made up that suit their needs. However, as soon as the team starts to grow and the company starts to grow, all those pipelines start being bottlenecks. So in terms of one of the... Uh, the first part of my answer to your question is I'm a big fan of dynamic, unlimited environments. And uh, this is basically the concept. This is a concept uh, that was um, made into reality by me and my team several times. The concept of an environment as something, as something that you can create Unlim unlimited amount of times, you can create it from scratch and you can create it quickly. And for the automotive sector, it's very important because whenever, whether you're, deploy whether you're developing, testing or demoing or releasing any part of the vehicle, you, that part of the vehicle is very interconnected with everything else. If it's a uh, steering by wire, it has to be tested, it has to be developed, tested, demoed and released together with the braking by wire, together with the infotainment systems and things like that. Everything is kind of together and it's really difficult if you only have one staging environment. So the, the first part of the answer to your question is, I, we, should, we should onboard more dynamic environments and we should be more flexible with the way that we deploy our software within the vehicle or in, in, the, um, in the digital ecosystem. And just to follow up on that, you talked about the dependencies that exist, but it seems to me that these vehicles have multiple systems in it. And so if there's a change in one, it can affect everything. And then you need to roll back the code. So do we have a, a good approach for rolling stuff back even after we deploy it? Um, the companies that test their rollback, they, those companies have a good rollback strategy. However, as you probably understand, the rollbacks, testing of the rollbacks usually gets pushed to the very bottom of backlog. And that's, it really, it takes a um, real uh, DevOps leader and um, CIO leader who understands the importance of this, who knows the cost of not testing the rollbacks to bring that feature up in the backlog and bring it to the front and uh, schedule it in a, in a sprint. Uh, so to about the rollbacks, it's all about the testing. You have to not just do the continuous deli <coughs> delivery of software. You need to do continuous rollback testing of and continuous rollbacking and rollback testing of your software. And you have to test it 
different versions with different versions of upstream downstream systems because you 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 will constantly have alpha beta gamma version of all the software and they're all interact with each other and that's impossible without the dynamic environments that i mentioned earlier mm-hmm. Michael, as a, someone who's focused on the development side of this equation, we have in these vehicles, we have the embedded systems, and then we have the over-the-air, more user space application kind of things. There's At least that's how I like to think about it. Um, how are we changing the way we deliver code onto those platforms? Are the developers delivering smaller amounts of code more frequently or are we still like dropping massive amounts of code bases because you know we were late in the first place yeah that's in, and, and really for my understanding from our discussion we had it really depends on the system right upgrading functional safety iso 26262 related software that's a tricky part right because if there's any mistake and the brake system may fail that's something which is very very challenging on the other side let's say more end customer fee- facing features uh, are seeing i i would assume and uh, try to explain a little bit in my, my my intro that that we would see really yeah a containerized deployment methods here for easy and and and, and simple exchange of features for adding new features and the question now is where, 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 how do these two worlds come together, right? On the one side, the functions. So, and when we talk about, and the, the, the discussion we had in the community, uh, most of the OMs who are now participating in the discussion don't think that we see containerized ISO 26262 functions for smaller ECUs or for safety relevant ECUs on short notice, because that's just way too complex and doesn't add a value. And especially you cannot handle the container environments in a way that that would be really safety relevant or safety compliant at the end of the day. Um, we see right now a trend to a, to a setup which is called Sonal Computer. That means usually one high performance computer in a, in a different re- in a specific region of the car with a lot of connected smaller sensors and, and small ECUs. And for the Sonal computers, I see that we see much more much more agile deployment methods um, because that's that's what what they are for, right? So these things are not necessarily always functional safety relevant. And these um, high performance, all they have enough resources to do these kind of updates because over the updates, all the needs a certain overhead and resources and users, small issues don't have that overhead and resources for, for these kind of over the air updates. All right. Yohai, I want to come to you for a second in your discussions with customers. We've established that this is fairly complex, but it seems that we also live in an uncertain economy these days. So from your perspective, are customers telling you they're a little more cost sensitive to how they go about building and deploying these applications? And what is how does that change the way they think about the process? Yeah, definitely. Um, and we're seeing it from both sides of the spectrum. You've got the folks who are still on-prem developing, um, looking to uh, maximize their hardware or you know, we've seen companies with the economic uh, uncertainty, um, you know, even extending the amount of time that they're you know normally would swap out hardware after three years, now extending it up to five years, and uh, really <coughs> looking down at you know cost cost consciousness um, in their environments. And then on the other side, we have those who um, either had gone to the cloud during COVID or or were thinking about it at one point. And are those who are already in the cloud, um, who are looking now at their, uh, you know, their bills, the, the classic bill shock, uh, and saying, okay, wait a minute, how do we rethink this? How, how do we look to see um, how we can, um, uh, you know, make the best out of our environments at the moment? And both, we see them again from both spectrums. Um, so, you know, the essence of maximizing your existing hardware for as long as you can. Um, you know, back orders of chips and and systems that can help you, um, you know, uh, keep up with the uh, insatiable need for compute power. And that's what we keep seeing. And how do you keep up? And, you know, the the large uh, um, uh, hardware providers are struggling to keep up. So, you know, we see, again, our customers looking to software uh, acceleration solutions like yourselves um, to really help them maximize what they have and to keep up with that constant demand. Um, on the cloud side as well, um, it's fascinating. In a, drawing back on the parallel that I was saying about gaming, um, you know, one of the big moves about um, moving development to the cloud in the world of gaming was to be able to create an entire environment that is already there for 
um, you know, with the tooling and all the the the, the latest um, systems that uh, you know the development studios were were uh, were, were need, need in a in a diff different environment, and we see customers going to that as well. Um, I think there was um, that the um, CES or a couple of big announcements about QNX and others going to the cloud. And we saw um, also AWS partnering with uh, Stellantis, doing some fascinating things in the cloud to be able to really utilize the cloud resources to the best ability. Of course, looking at, at, uh, at, the, at the cost element of that as well, understanding that it comes along with it. So there too, in the cloud, um, I think the tip that we give that we help our customers with is um, being able to, the more you get intimate with your your build and what you know goes on and the iterations and the complexities and the bottlenecks, uh, you need to find a way to, to be able to marry that to the exact need that you have. You need a system that would be able to automate so that when you're spinning up or spinning down instances for your builds, uh, you're getting the right, you know, the right uh, amount of uh, of compute power for the right price at the right time. Ilya, are you seeing the same thing? Is there more sensitivity to cost than there was before? I mean, not too long ago, it was just we were happy to have the code, right? Yeah, I just wanted to add on the topic. Uh, first, before before I I proceed, let me kind of take a step back to what Yohai said earlier. Uh, Software defined vehicles go hand in hand with simulations, with the Unreal Engine, with everything else. If you are developing a website and something goes wrong, you just close the website, redeploy the web server, you can test it again. If something is going wrong with the robo factoring, with the robotics, or with the vehicle, you can't just you know turn it off and build a new one. So that's that's where simulations are very important and the autom automotive industry is using simulations so much now and increasingly more and more frequently and that comes with the cost right because you have to pay for the gpus you have to run the unreal engine simulations and you have to run them as so frequently as frequent as frequently as as of high of what at, at the the higher the, the quality of software you want to get, the more frequently you have to run those simulations. And I'm going to be, I'm just going to go ahead uh, and be the continuous, continuous guy. Every answer to the question is going to be just run it continuously. Run your cost optimization continuously. That's my answer to the cost. Even if you're spending one hour per month to just look at your AWS build, uh, to just look at your cloud bill and just make one thing, just make one uh, change that will affect uh, the cloud cost. Do that, and then the next month you'll you'll do you'll do two hours, and then uh, and more and more after that. So I'm just straight. I'll, I'll repeat that. Release and iterate. This works for the OTA. This works for the cost optimization. This works for deployments. Do do one thing and then improve on top of that. All right, infrastructure is never free, no matter what. Um, yes. Hey, Michael. Mike, I just wanted to ask you. Go so ahead, ahead. We, we talked about re resources, right? Uh, that what about the, the people? Uh, they're also resources, and and I, it, what came to mind is if you guys were following the the awards, but uh, everywhere, uh, all everywhere, all at once. What was that movie? Anywhere, everywhere, all at once. That uh, cult cult classic that's been created. So that. That phrase reminds me of the complexities of the developers behind this all, because you're not just, you know, coding and, and complex C++ and, and different projects, you know, brought together, but you have to have, you know, the minute you have connectivity in mind, you're opened up to security and then you have to have that in mind. You have to have safety in mind. And I think one of the big things that we see about, you know, resource management or retaining good people, you need quality, good uh, you know, talent uh, for this industry as well. And and some of the things that we see from our customers is, um, you know, when you've got, you know, crunch time, when you've got this, this uh, you know, this need for speed and to, to get to production, you, you can't let that, you know, uh, um, run your people down, right? And that's, that's a, a big thing that we look at uh, overall about uh, developer experience and, uh, and productivity um, to the point of, you know, we have customers who who were ruthless for overtime, 
you know, uh, paying overtime for for developers to to meet these these deadlines with all these complex complexities. And they're looking at how exactly can we do the impossible, right? <laughs> Reduce the complexities, go quicker, but you know, keep your good people and and be a place where you can actually uh, um, uh, be attractive to some of the the big <laughs> out there in the market today. So I was just curious what the the panel has to say about that. Michael, you want to jump in on that? Because um, it does seem like there's we're trying to strike a balance between the developer experience and cost and time to delivery. And these three things are not always uh, easy to kind of bring together. So here's, here's what, what, what is currently going to, to, my, to my mind, right? So uh, the question is, and I, I would be interested to get feedback here is, do the right things or do the things right? And in the perfect world, we'll do the right things right, right? But you can do a lot of things in a, in a very perfect way, even when it comes to DevOps, but you are not doing the right things. Um, and I think that's something now, we, we talk about a lot about our doing the things right, but not necessarily about doing the right things. And I think that's something all the automotive industry uh, needs to talk about, right? So we, we, can, the, we, we see that increase in complexity but as I try to explain with the difference in the German wording, are we always doing the right things? Um, and, and I think having a perfect tool chain is nice, but if you build stuff which you don't need, uh, it's it's not enough to have a perfect tool chain. Right? And the question here is, sometimes I have the feeling that especially the traditional automotive industry is doing the things right, but not always necessarily doing the right things. Hmm. Ilya, let's follow up on that because it's my sense that being in this particular vertical is more stressful than many other verticals in the sense that, um, you know, if I miss a project schedule, I just go into the next release of the application and, you know, we move along and somebody will maybe, you know, look at me and frown. But in this industry, if you miss the platform delivery schedule, you're off by a whole year and basically the next car is coming down the manufacturing line and, suddenly, you know, entire revenue and shareholder value is tied to this conversation. So, you know, how stressful is it to be in this particular sector in, from your perspective? I prefer to think of it as exciting, not stressful. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, and uh, I'm going to add to what Michael said. Uh, companies, seems like a lot of companies even if they're doing the right thing in the right way, sometimes that's not even enough because they're all doing, they're all solving the same problem. And that means that they're learning the right things the right way really quickly with the right minds, but they're doing it all over again. And I don't think this is sustainable. That's why um, I love what you're doing with the Eclipse project where you kind of, um, motivate to share more and this is not just about sharing you know the source code once you share the source code once once you decrease the amount of um diversity in terms of the platforms you also share the expertise and you share the knowledge so because you form a community yeah. that kind of teaches themselves and that's kind of like what we do at beam rich we, we take what we know and we try to apply it as impactful as possible in other companies without, um, you know, compromising um, our client, our customers in any way. So I think it's important to do the right thing, to do the right thing in the right way and to also share the information. And I believe that the automotive industry is lacking that last thing a lot. Everybody is kind of uh, for themselves um yeah yeah all right well we do have one question but i i want to just preface this real quick um you know short of the politics involved in any of these decisions and questions but um is it more challenging michael because there are more regulations in this space and there's a lot more <laughs> of these uh external stakeholders expressing opinions about how things should be developed so I have a nice slide and I have not at hand, but so where, where our executive director, Mike Milinkovic, who was in the field of open source since about 20 years now, and he said 20 years ago, was open, the success criteria for an open source project, it solves the technology problem. 
the success criteria for today, and I don't get this complete sense. I think there's six lines of code, uh, six lines of wording. It's it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be it needs to be diversity. It needs to be welcoming. It needs to be green, and so on and so on and so on. And absolutely yes, we see this. So open source gets more like uh, mainstream. That's and it's getting more and more traction even among the industry. It's not any longer this lone warrior who's writing open source in the night or something like this. Open source becomes more and more, let's say, an alternative as a collaboration model for the industry. And, and um, yeah, though that's, that's, we are going in that direction. But this means, if you look at the automotive industry, they all have these obligations to have carbon dioxide footprinting, supply chain stuff and other things. So for sure, the complexity of the open source project next to the open source code is increasing as well. And so that's all the why, why we think that doing these things under the umbrella of foundation, which can provide a lot of support here, is usually quite useful. Right. Ilya, are you seeing in any way this uh, EU Green Deal is specifically affecting application development or DevOps processes, or you guys are still waiting to see how that might play out? No, we definitely feel it. We definitely feel it because this this Green Deal, and there, it's not the only thing coming out, there are restrictions and there are kind of details in the restrictions and uh, they usually force certain changes from the top. Uh, today, you're building one thing, tomorrow that thing has to be three centimeters shorter. Um, but that only makes the work of a DevOps more important and that only puts additional insurance, additional certainty into the fact that what we do has to be flexible as well. We're not, we, we, we cannot get stuck building a monolithic, unchangeable, perfect car that fits everybody. We have to make the manufacturing, the, the uh, delivery and the whole process, the whole manufacturing and update process has to be flexible. We have to build, right now is the best time and the main concern is to build a flexible modular platform that will allow building on top of it different things depending on what, what's coming in. The green deal, the yellow deal, the, any kind of uh, deal that's coming in, uh, we will be able to support it as, a, as the industry. And I think the whoever does that first, whoever creates that flexible modular platform is going to be the, you know, the innovator of the industry in the next 10 years. Yeah. And maybe I would like to add on this one. And that's one thing we, we already in a couple of comments here stating, yeah, SOP. So everything needs to be ready on the start of production, right? We need to get rid of that paradigm. I'm 100% sure. But in the past, software had to be safe, secure, on time, feature complete. I think in two to three years from now, and I know that OEMs are, other OEMs are already much more advanced here. It only needs to be safe and secure. On time and feature complete are not, shall not be requirements for software. And the challenge here is that the traditional automotive industry is still sinking very much in bill of materials. So, you buy a system and the hardware is defined three years at the project start. And then the companies who develop software try to fit their software into the usually limited hardware at 70, 60 to 70 percent is just utilization and deployment on this usually limited hardware. And over the last years, almost the last decades, I would say, Software was always following the hardware. So the hardware was defined, the hardware was defined, defined the bill of materials, and software was just always seen as an add-on. I think what we need to see here in the automotive industry to keep relevant, that these things need to be separated. So if you look at your mobile phone, I'm not saying that automotive comes with other challenges, right? Cars are potentially deadly machine. You need to make sure that the underlying systems are safe. But still, if you are not able to get this separation of software and hardware, you have a problem. And see Tesla, for example, they're building uh, uh, very powerful computers into the cars, and they have they have the, the, the resources to add new features. If you don't have the needed resources at the beginning when you sell the car, you cannot add features afterwards, right? So coming from a very limited and very 
tailored hardware design just to save a couple of pennies for the, 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 the hardware when you start the production to a gen general purpose hardware, which comes when it's sold initially, has maybe too many resources for all the features which are operated, but then give the opportunity to add features. And this separation needs to take place. And interestingly, that's not necessarily only a technical discussion, but that's very much a mindset topic, which is through the complete organization, including purchasing, including strategic, strategic departments, including whatever legal departments, when we talk about liability, when we talk about other things. And I think there's still a big change and that's not only on the technology side, but it needs to be done. Yoha, in your conversations with folks, did you get a sense that the mindsets were changing? Were people becoming more open to how they approach <laughs> software versus hardware or were they still conflating the two? Um, yeah, I, I feel that they're, they're, it, it's gradually coming together. I can't say we're there at the moment, uh, but definitely. I mean, again, th th these dreams you talked about, Michael, about, you know, buying, being able to buy a car and, you know, if you wanted a certain upgrade to just subscribe to it, right? That's, that's the talk now about the model, the subscription model, being able to add features as they go along um, is, you know, it's a great story. Um, the question is how, how, how the two come together um, and being able to, again, de deliver that from the get-go is, is a big challenge, definitely. Right. Michael, I want to get your opinion on the security side of this equation because you connected security and safety. And we do see a lot of conversation about shifting responsibility for application security, at least left towards developers, um, in my experience, most developers, uh, security was an elective when they were trained and most of them didn't take it. So um, what's your sense of what is the state of the art among developers and their appreciation for security? So there, I, I'm not an expert on this. I would like just to make that statement at the very beginning. What do I see are these new regulations on the UNEC, for example, about cyber resilience and other things. So there's a lot of ongoing regulation work here, which needs to be considered in the development of the cars. Um, and I, I, I joined recently a conference where I think a senior executive from Ford said, hey, would we be able, if you find a, a vulnerability, uh, to fix this within 24 hours? And the complete audience said, no. And I think that's exactly something where, where, where the automotive industry needs all the improvement from a liability perspective, right? If there is a serious issue in your software, security flaw or something similar, and you would have the capability to fix us via the over-the-air update. How can you judge at the end? If, don't, I don't want to scare anyone, right? But assume something serious will happen and you end up in, in front of the court. How can you judge? How can you justify that it takes you six weeks or three months to fix a security flaw? For Don't get me wrong, for infotainment functions, that's not a problem. But if you come to functions, for, let's say, for the, in the driver system systems, autopilot, just to name a, a prominent wording here, you would not be able to do so. So you, you expose yourself at a much higher risk. So security needs to be next to safety, but security as well, right? Needs to be at the core of every thinking and it needs to be, it needs to have this, this capability to fix security issues as, as fast as possible. But you ask for the developers. Yes, in the development process, this will be become more relevant as well. So and again, the question is, is security something which is differentiating in, 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 in is a differentiating feature? So as of today, now let me get back. Safety. 15 years ago, people bought a car because it had a five-star NCAP test. Nowadays, you cannot sell this car without a five-star NCAP test. So safety has become a hygienic factor, commodity, right? You have to have it, otherwise you cannot sell the cars. I would assume that the same will happen with security. Other than your mobile phone, if someone hacks your mobile phone, okay, then I buy a new one, I get angry. But if someone hacks your car, that's a different story. So I would assume that the automobile industry cannot avoid to spend a lot of efforts to build secure software. And But the, 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 the backside of this one is once this is accomplished, it will become a hygienic factor. You cannot sell a car just because that's secure software. So there will be more requirements for developers that need to take care about this one. Unfortunately, it will be most likely not a feature you can sell your car with at the end of the day. All right. Ilya, it, we're getting towards the end here, and there's a lot going on, right? It's complex. There's security. There's all these other issues. 
Are there, in your mind, where does crunch time and the challenge of meeting deadlines, where does that all come <laughs> to the rubber meets the DevOps road? And, and how do you kind of approach that? And, and what's your best advice to folks? My best advice is to have fun. <laughs> Whatever comes out of this is going to be brilliant. Uh, you're not alone in the game. A lot of companies, a lot of really good professionals are working on whatever you're working or working side by side with you, should I say. So, and, and we are here in the, in the long run. We are in the long game. It's not a matter of a year or two years. It's a matter of a couple of decades, I think. And uh, so just have fun and try to stay in the game for a long time. And having fun is the way to do it. All right. Yohai, you got some closing thoughts you want to share as it relates to all this now that you've heard the perspectives of both Ilya and Michael? Yeah, I, I just going off of, of what Michael was saying, um, you know, I talked to it a little bit about the beginning about faster iteration speed to get getting to the, you know, to the to the demand of the market. Uh, and and many organizations you know, want to be first first to market with certain things. But there's, you know, the other element of uh, we talked about security and safety that I wanted just to add that, um, you know, when these organizations are looking to iterate more it's not just for first to market but it's also having more time for safety and security shift left as we all know the devops world is pretty big um we do see that um become you know just as important as everywhere else so the more the more time the more you can iterate the more time you have for your testing and uh for security and safety uh definitely the better so definitely recommend uh for for our audience and all those out there uh, to look at those both perspectives, not just getting to market with uh, with with the the best uh, features and technology out there, but if something does happen, things change, regulations change, do you have a, a plan in place so that you can quickly fix, iterate, and get out there quickly? All right, folks. Hey, I want to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise, and I also want to throw in one last comment from one of our uh, attendees who notes that we're maybe there's just a lot more to cover here that we can get to in an hour, but he also notes that engine admission, fuel management, electric cars are all going to be more challenging as we go along. And we have to figure out how to make these cars last for a hundred thousand miles and more and not break them down as we put in all these software updates. So it's a challenging time, but with that folks, thank you for attending. I want to hand it back to Cody who's going to take us out from here. Great. Thank you, Mike. And thank you so much to our panel for being here with us today. I'd like to remind our audience that today's session was recorded. So you will be receiving an email with a link to access this recording on demand. Or of course, you can find it living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars. Our four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are uh, Kareen B, Yves T, Daniel P, and it's uh, Darren or Duran P. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. You should be receiving that email in about 48 hours. Um, if you don't happen to see that email, do check your spam folder in case it gets filtered out. I'd like to thank Incredibuild for sponsoring our program today. And to our audience, thank you so much for being here with us for the past hour. We really value your time and we also value your feedback. So as soon as we close out here, there will be a survey on your screen. Let us know your thoughts about our program today or maybe what you'd like to see on an upcoming program. Otherwise, we do hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day and to our panel, thank you once more. Bye.